Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. I am here today with Leanne Townsend, who is a fellow family attorney. She is a partner with Brody Thorning LLP in Toronto, and she practices exclusively in family law with a particular expertise in cases involving domestic violence. She brings a balanced approach to her practice, combining compassion and her strength as a litigator, and is regularly interviewed in the media, on radio, and on other podcasts. And she has her own podcast as well called Divorcing Well, as well as a YouTube show that is launching soon that I will talk to her about. So, hey, Leanne, welcome. Hi, happy to be here. It's been a while since I've had a fellow family law practitioner on, and I think it's always really good to have these conversations with someone else in the industry and have other people hear the conversations about what happens in this world and this profession that that we do, because I think everyone, when they go through a divorce, comes and expects their lawyers to work a miracle or, you know, spin the law in a different way than what courts are doing. Um, So thank you for, for coming on. So let's, you know, let's first talk a little bit about your background in domestic violence, because that's a really big one. Can you share um, how you got started and, you know, where you, because you're not doing, you had a different role before you um, became a partner in your current firm. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yes. um, The first um, approximately 16, 17 years of my career, I was a prosecutor. I was a a Crown attorney um, in the Toronto West Crown's office. And a good chunk of the time that I was there, my specialty was domestic violence. And I was the co-lead of the domestic violence uh, prosecution team. So I, you know, I have received a lot of training in the area, but I've also got a lot of experience dealing with victims of abuse, dealing with, you know, the prosecution of those types of cases and have a lot of familiarity with the dynamics, um, you know, that for people in, you know, who are victims of it and also, you know, abusers. So um, I bring that to my family law practice because I do find that, you know, whether it's physical abuse, which is what I dealt with, you know, more in the Crown's office, because emotional abuse and psychological abuse aren't crimes here at this time. Um, But a lot of the dynamic, the power and control dynamic is similar in all areas of of abuse. And I find, you know, in family law, you do come across a lot of clients who on some level have, you know, suffered some type of abuse in their relationships. Um, Do you find that just based on what you've learned and spending so many years in this, that it takes more than once for someone to finally leave that relationship? Oh, definitely. I mean, and that was even like part of the training we we had uh, in the Crown's office was, you know, for someone to get to the point where they actually pick up the phone and call the police. It's happened many, 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 many times before someone, you know, finally reaches that point. So I think it's actually a very rare person that um, you know, calls the police the, the first time. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but generally, you know, and generally it's insidious, like domestic violence, it starts out with smaller things. And usually it does start out with the verbal and emotional and that sort of thing. And, you know, kind of in a sense, almost grooms the victim because they, you know, their self-esteem gets more worn down and they start to feel like they don't deserve to be treated properly so that when the if it elevates to the physical level they're already almost so beaten down uh emotionally by that point they don't see it as being as wrong as you know they would have before they were ever in the relationship yeah and then that's that's so hard um are you finding that people are making false claims of domestic violence or are using that in their divorce to try to further their case or get someone out of the house do you ever see um, that? Yeah, I definitely see that. And, you know, and it's interesting because as a crown, of course, I was always on the side of the, the, the complainant, right? So if somebody called the police, I was going to be always on the side that yes, it happened. Although I found even in that role, you know, I'd have victims coming to me and pleading with me to withdraw charges and saying that it didn't happen the way that they said it happened or that it was a mutual fight and things like that. But I do find, you know, in family law, I have clients where I, you know, again, at at the end of the day, none of us know what happened other than the people who were there at the time. But I have clients where I feel 
you know, the circumstances and the facts very much suggest that they've been accused of something for the, their spouse to gain a strategic advantage, you know, in the family court proceedings, like getting exclusive possession of the matrimonial home and things like that. So, and, and it's very sad that people do that because it then it just undermines the credibility of, you know, the true victims, um, you know, when there are some that are false complaints. So what is domestic violence to the extent that someone can call the police or have um, what you used to do as a prosecutor step in? And you talked about physical versus emotional, but what rises to the level of domestic violence? Um, well, any form of physical, you know, like a, a slap would be um, throwing. I've, I remember having a case where someone threw an empty water bottle uh, at their spouse. Um, that was assault with a weapon, if you can believe it. Um, I mean, wow. I think that's a bit extreme, but but that is sufficient for there to be a charge. And I'm not going to say I think it's extreme. I don't think anyone should throw a water bottle at anybody. But still, um, that could potentially be a charge. Um, also threats. So th there doesn't necessarily have to be the physical violence if somebody threatens to kill their spouse or threatens to cause them bodily harm. Um, those that would be threatening charges. And then there's the other one that's criminal harassment. So that that usually involves like repeated actions of harassment or stalking or, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing that caused the victim to fear for their safety. And so there isn't that emotional component, because I know so often, and I'm, I'm sure you come across this a lot too, you do have emotional abuse that happens in marriages. And um, there's, there's all kinds of underlying reasons. And a lot of times there's mental illness, but for purposes of prosecuting a domestic violence case, that does not include that, that particular, um, that type of relationship. That's correct. It doesn't um, include like emotional or verbal unless it amounts to a threat. And, and it's interesting because I believe I read that in the UK, um, they may classify, it might, it might, and it might not be the UK, it could be somewhere else in Europe, uh, but they do classify um, mental or emotional abuse as potentially criminal action. And so um, I think that's really interesting because you know, the reality is that a physical scar will heal much faster quite often than, you know, an yeah. emotional scar or something terribly mean that somebody said, um, you know, but I think it's, it's hard, I think, if the, when those start, if those were to become criminal offenses, because, like, it's, again, it's what, I think that there's certain things that are very, very clearly emotional abuse or verbal abuse, but then there's a fine line with certain types of you know, when people are arguing and their mean side comes out and they're, I don't, you know, it, it just gets murkier in certain types of cases. So, you know, in the ones where it's really clear cut, I think that would, you know, maybe be easier to, to prosecute if it was a criminal offense. But um, I mean, I know in my practice, I don't, you know, know what, what you found, but like every, almost every case, um, somebody's claiming, you know, that they've been emotionally abused by their yeah. spouse. Right. You, you know, something else that comes up or I hear a lot, and it's kind of unfortunate is someone hesitates, um, a true victim hesitates to call the police because they have in the past, and then they too have been arrested. And I know like our state is not supposed to do that. Um, there's police training and there there's been all kinds of things put into place so that that doesn't happen but yet we still see it happen over and over again so what do you say to someone who is afraid of that happening if they call the police and do you see that happening a lot yeah I mean I've seen that happening a lot you know both in family law and as a like as a crown prosecutor here, I found that as well. Um, and, you know, again, like the police have training, you're supposed to identify the primary, you know, perpetrator and things like that. Um, but I guess, you know, sometimes they get called to the scene and they genuinely don't know. And yeah. I mean, I've had cases, I had a case last year where my client was the wife and she got arrested. You know, she had been a victim of domestic violence through the relationship. I really believe that. But he called the police on her and she was drunk. And so the police ended up arresting her and she got the charge ended up being withdrawn, but she shouldn't have had to go through all of that. Yeah. It was re-victimizing her. Um, but I also think there's a lot of men 
that are afraid um, because, you know, they're afraid that if, a, if they call the police, that the police will arrest them, even if the woman was the one who was the perpetrator. Um, and I think that a lot of men feel that there's a bias that way in favor of women. Um, and they, even if they didn't do anything, if she calls the police and says something, they're like, they're gone, they're out of the house, they're arrested. And they're, I think, you know, and, and there's, I think, unfortunately, there is still a, like a stigma for men to report, you know, if they are a victim of domestic violence, because, you know, people think, well, you're the man, like, how can you be? And, and there are men who are, you know, I have a yeah. client right now, his wife is terrible to him. Um, terrible. And, but he, you know, he doesn't, he's, he, he has called the police one time, but um, I don't think they fully, they didn't really believe, they didn't do anything. They didn't arrest yeah. her or anything. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. I, you know, it's just, it's like, what, what kind of additional training can, can prevent something like that? Like, where is the disconnect? Because we see that too. And we definitely have men who are truly victimized and, um, and they have the same fear and they don't call the police. And, and even, you know, I've had similar cases where the men are the ones arrested and they really haven't done anything. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate. So what advice do you have for someone who finds himself in this situation? Um, one, if they're the person who had the water bottle thrown at them and <laughs> two, if they're, you know, if there's, if it's truly a, you know, a really toxic, unhealthy, um, and violent relationship. So two different scenarios. I mean, I definitely always tell people that if you are concerned for your safety, um, and, you know, there's something going on in your home that's, you know, with your spouse and that's causing you to fear for your safety, then you should call the police. Like, you know, don't, it, it, it's anyone, someone's safety should never be in jeopardy, but they need to also, like with the water bottle thing, for example, um, I don't know that I, I would tell someone to call the police in that situation. Um, but if they, if it was a pattern where there was other stuff that had happened that they didn't call the police and then that happened and, but that was more recent. So, you know, it, then maybe in that, it, it's very contextual, I guess, in fact, specific what I would say, but I also, um, because I found when I was a prosecutor, the one thing that, you know, was very common was that a lot of times when someone picks up the phone and calls the police, they don't fully even appreciate what's going to happen. Like they think that yeah. the police are going to come and maybe ask their spouse to leave for the night, but they don't understand that charges will most likely be laid that the spouse will be removed from the home, the spouse will not be allowed to have contact with them until the matter is dealt with in court. Um, and that it's, you know, it's going to raise all these difficulties with respect to children and child rearing, and they're suddenly going to be a single parent for a period of months and years, you know, depending on how long it takes for something to go through the system and potentially have a trial or whatever. And in the moment, they don't, they're there they don't realize like and once you set that in motion you also lose control because at the I don't know how it is where you are but up here in in Canada and in, in Ontario where I live um the police have the power to lay the charge and the prosecutors have the power to withdraw the charge and a lot of times victims think that they have the decision to withdraw the charge and they do not. Um, and they may want it withdrawn and the prosecutor may still say no. Their, their view and, and opinion is one factor, but it's not the only factor that the prosecutor takes into account. So when people pick up that phone, they lose control. You know, if they decide they want the spouse back and the charge, they didn't mean to, for him to be arrested or her to be arrested, they don't have control over that. Um, and they don't real, they, a lot of people don't realize that. But again, having said that, if you are in, you know, if you are unsafe and you're potentially going to be harmed, like you should definitely call the police, even though, you know, that's all of what I just said is going to happen. Yeah. Um, do you have where you are the, the civil version of a restraining order too? Like we have the yes. criminal and then you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have that as well. And, and with the civil the person who files can withdraw that any time. It doesn't have the same criminal implications, but a lot of times it still removes somebody from the house. Um, and, and sometimes I think this is where we see more so it's strategically used in a divorce to try to get someone out of the house. And it always ends up backfiring when it's used for that purpose. Yes, yes. It's, and we have that here. Um, and it's, 
like I find she what we see is just people getting orders for exclusive possession and the restraining order yeah. kind of at the same time. And those can be done, you know, temporarily, they can be done without notice even. Um, yeah. And, you know, but not for a long term. But I mean, it, it, it just kind of can start the ball rolling in a certain direction that can be more difficult to unwind if you're the other party. Yeah. Okay, so let's flip the switch a little bit and talk about the divorce process. Um, one of the questions that I've been asked through all of my years of practicing is, um, and it kind of cracks me up when someone asks the question is, what is this, what's your success rate? And, you know, my response always is, well, if you, you know, if you determine it, if the measure is if you're going to get divorced, then my success rate's a hundred percent, but otherwise, <laughs> you know, that's a really tricky question. So what would you answer? Um, not your success rate, but what does a successful divorce look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think a successful divorce looks like, first of all, the children are, um, coming out of it healthy that the parties haven't un, you know improperly involved them in anything and they've come out of it with a, a solid parenting plan you know involving both parents in their children's lives um, and then you know I would say on some level a successful divorce is just somebody getting in terms of like you know assets or support or whatever what they're legally entitled to get um and what they're ha and i think bigger the bigger point is just what they're oh i shouldn't say that i was gonna say what they're happy yeah. with but very seldom yeah. people are never happy <laughs> right <laughs> so even if they got what they were entitled to they're not happy if they you know get more they're not happy and if they get less yeah. they're not happy so that's certainly <laughs> not a measure um but i think that you know, I, I'm, I think maybe it's my background as a prosecutor, like I'm all about justice and fairness. And so I, you know, if somebody wants to go after something they're not entitled to, I mean, I guess, you know, you can still make, if, if there's, you know, certain, as you would know, like there's certain areas that are more gray, right? Like they, yeah. we wouldn't need lawyers if everything was black and white and it was as simple as just following a statute or a case. Like there's lots of areas where it's gray. And so, you know, I think helping a client um, get the result that they, you know, want it to, that's a fair result, you know, and as they say, and the kids have come out of it and not been involved in it, I would consider that a successful divorce, I think. But that's a tough question. I'm interested, what's your yeah. answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's very similar. It's because there is, like, there's no such thing as success in these cases. And you're right, no matter what the end result is, you, you're, someone's not going to be entirely happy because no one gets everything they want in, in the divorce process. They have to compromise. There's, if you go in front of a judge, the judge is going to divide things up based on what they think is fair, which is probably never the same thing that the party thinks is fair. Um, so, you know, it, it is a tough question, um, but it's just so interesting when people ask it because they're, they come in thinking like there is actually the potential for success in this outcome. And um, even some of the best results that I've ever had, I've had clients who weren't happy with them. So, yeah. Um, what about, you, you know, as divorce lawyers, um, we always try to help people get to an, an agreement. And um, not all of us do that, but I think a lot of us do. And I'm, I, I'm understanding from how you're talking, you are one of those that really tries to help families. Is there a time when um, that comes off the table and you say to someone, trial is going to be your best option? And, you know, why does that case different than the ones that are negotiated or mediated? Um, definitely that you know, is the case sometimes, um, you know, if there's case, situations where the other spouse is unnecessarily delaying things, like there's delays with them providing their financial statement or disclosures, I find, you know, getting it in a, into a court, like they've got, a, you know, accountability and timelines that they have to follow else there's a consequence. So in those types of situations, um, where you're dealing with a spouse who you can tell just is not going to negotiate. I mean, some people are like that. It's their way or the highway. Um, and, you know, so that would be another situation. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I find like that's, I don't know if where you are, if they have something called collaborative law, but yep. we have that here. And one of the beefs I actually have with it is that when people sign up with a collaborative lawyer to do collaborative law, they also have to say that they're not going to litigate. And if they yeah. are, then they have to get a whole new lawyer 
and start over again. And to me that I, I don't understand that approach because I think a client should have all options at their disposal in the same lawyer. And so I feel like I can still do collaborative law, but it's not officially collaborative yeah. law um, and negotiate something. And I always think people should try and settle and not go in, into court if they, if it can be avoided. Um, but there are cases where it's necessary. And, you know, one thing I found earlier on in my practice that I fell prey to and th that I see going on with some lawyers is you can get into these endless letter writing campaigns where, you know, someone retains you and you and the other lawyer, like it's just letters back and forth and back and forth and months and months and months and months go on and nothing's really advanced in the case. And it's just this endless letter writing. And then meanwhile, the client is paid you know, $7,000 or something. And they're like, I, we haven't even done anything. And so that's another example where sometimes I just think it's better to actually file an application, start the court process, and you can always pull out of it. You don't have to, you know, but it, like, it, it just can be actually sometimes more cost effective than like, and, you know, if you're dealing with another lawyer who's into this long, endless letter writing where you're accusing all the time and it, it's just nonsense um I, I i sometimes as they say i feel like that's not the, not the right approach quite often either yeah um and i agree with you on the collaborative i've been trained in collaborative and i do it and i would i try to steer people away from it i think every collaborative i've ever done has been much more expensive than mediation or more of a cooperative approach where everyone's yeah. really sitting down together. But without the, you know, my beef with it is all of the processes and steps. Like you have a meeting to talk about the meeting. And like, I'm <laughs> like, let's just roll up our sleeves and get to work. Like, why yeah. do we need to have a meeting to talk about that? So um, I, I'm with you on that one because you can still get to the end result and reach an agreement and, um, and negotiate without that actual formal putting yeah. a stamp on it that forces people to step out if you can't reach an agreement. And then I think a lot of people end up sort of forced into signing that agreement because they've come that far and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, they don't want the alternative. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think it's misleading because I think it makes it sound like other lawyers can't be collaborative. Yeah, um, right. You know, and but it's not like you can't be collaborative as per like the, the law society definition or whatever, maybe, but you can still be collaborative. All right. So now, uh, like, uh, let's dish about other lawyers for a minute, um, <laughs> because not all lawyers are created equal. And I think in this profession, you do have people exactly like you were just talking about that um, have a certain approach that is not effective um, in family law. So uh, do you actually change how your strategy based on the the lawyer on the other side? And do you ever not take a case because there's a particularly troublesome lawyer on the other side? Um, I have never not taken a case because of there being a troublesome lawyer on the other side. Although it's not to say that that wouldn't couldn't happen. Um, yeah. You know, because there's certain lawyers that I've dealt with that I would not want to have to deal with again. Um, but yeah, I mean, my approach does differ depending on the lawyer. If I have a lawyer who has more of um, an, the view that I do that, you know, people, it's better for people to try and negotiate their own settlement and not litigate and be reasonable, then that's the approach that I use. But sometimes I'm up against a lawyer who is believes in you know disagreeing with every possible thing under the sun and is highly litigious and very aggressive and so I have to take on a more litigious aggressive approach in return um I don't like those cases because I don't think it actually serves any of the clients well I think that lawyers who are like that their clients think that oh this is yes. great I've got this yeah. pit bull look at look at them look at them telling my spouse off but all they end up doing is running up huge legal bills yeah. and unnecessarily so, but the client doesn't often, their client doesn't often understand that. And it's funny because I had a case very recently where the lawyers are like that and they started an action in civil court um, for initially it was for, for, for like selling the home, um, which was what we consented to that. But then they went on and they were bringing an action about the distribution of the proceeds of the home. And we kept saying like, this needs to be in family court. There's family law issues here. And 
it just last week, the judge agreed and moved it to family court. So we're going to be asking for a lot of costs. Um, yeah. But it was just a ridiculous, like this lawyer was doing such a disservice to their client yeah. by continuing along. And, but they were so aggressive and nasty in the things they would write in their letters and say, I'm sure, you know, the client thought, oh, these people are great. Like they're yeah. showing the other side. But ultimately, you know, when he gets, gets, an order of having to pay my client's costs as well as paying his own, I don't think he's going to be as happy with them. That, and that is such a good point. And it's so important because I, we've seen that too. And sometimes it will be like, well, they're, they're bullying you or they're bullying us, or why aren't we being aggressive like that? <laughs> um, and, and like, they don't understand that, 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 that doesn't get you a better result. That level yeah. of aggression and doing all of that and driving up costs does not change change the end results, um, except for the end, the, that final number on their invoice, which is never pretty. So um, such an important point. Let's talk about your new YouTube show that you have coming out in March. What is it called? And what is it about? Uh, it's called The Dish on Divorce. And it was actually a client of mine who came up with the name. So um, that was kind of nice. I did like a social media poll and had a couple names and then she just offered that one out of the blue. So and it fit. So uh, I was happy about that. Um, I'm, I have a co host for the show. Um, her, it's a friend of mine named Jennifer Barkin, who is an accredited family mediator. And the idea of the show that the, what makes it a little different from my podcast is it's supposed to be a little bit like, like we're going to have serious guests on and have some serious topics, but we also want to have a lighter side to it because divorce is such a heavy topic. We want to have, you know, some of it where we discuss celebrity divorces yeah. or, um, you know, dating, funny dating, divorce, dating after divorce stories. And so we want to kind of have a mixture of serious and light and the idea is that, like that Jennifer and I were just supposed to, we're we're like your girlfriends and just it's, it's like sit let's sit down have a coffee have a drink and talk about divorce and so that's the goal of the show we want to be very oriented towards our audience and what they want to hear about and and have it we're thinking of live streaming it so it can be more interactive um and uh, I'm really excited about it that's fine. So anyone who's listening, first follow Leanne on her Instagram and I'll put the handle in the show notes and then you'll be able to um, follow her on the on her YouTube and get all of the information there. So thank you so much, Leanne. So many good nuggets of wisdom dropped today. I really appreciate you being here and um, keep up the, the good fight, I guess, if that's, <laughs> if that's what too. it's called. <laughs> no, thank thank you. you so much. It's been a pleasure.